Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our hot church. We are hot. Um, <laughs> I just noticed that our screen went off, so I'm going to buy a little time before we get into our first hymn. Um, I will welcome you, though. We're glad that you are here. We are sorry that it is not cooler in here. Um, it was last night, and this morning it wasn't. So that is being looked at. Um, <clears throat> But at the same time, we are happy to be here and uh, able to praise our God because he is our God, whether we are cool and comfortable or whether it's hot out, right? Amen. Amen. Um, looks like our live stream is getting back up, which is good. So I want to uh, encourage you that as we go through worship today, specifically as we sing our hymns and our songs, feel free to worship in whatever position you would like. You can sit, you can stand. Whatever makes you most comfortable is fine. So I will just continue now. A little funny fact as I'm still waiting for the screen. Um, this morning, Pastor Scott comes up and he says, I think we're going to call an audible. Uh, we're going to preach on hell this morning. Um, <laughs> And the fact that if you think it's hot in here, best better get right with God because it's hotter in hell, right? So, <laughs> all right. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to uh, start with our first hymn. So join us. You can, if the screen comes up, you can look on the screen. But you can go into your hymn books, hymn number 345, Blessed Assurance. Good morning. You can have a seat. 
So what Will didn't mention is we just thought as summer's winding down, that usually makes people sad. So we just decided to keep the air conditioning off to give you the full experience of the heat of the summer. Um, no, I'm just kidding. We're working on that. Thanks for your patience, um, your flexibility as we deal with that this morning, even though you didn't have a choice. But thank you anyway. Well, we don't have a lot of announcements this morning, but one other thing that I do need to let you know about also as summer is winding down is this coming Thursday is our last kids' day, so make sure uh, you, you get your kids to that. Kids, you can bug your parents about that. We don't want you to miss that. Um, those have been really special throughout the summer, and we want you to be able to be a part of that this coming Thursday for the last one. Let me just pray real quick, um, and then I'll turn it over to Ruth Marie for our children's message this morning. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for all that you are. There's so many things that, that we have to thank you for. So many things that, that we have to praise you for. And Lord, just like we, we sang now, this is our story. We want to praise you all day long for, the, for who you are, for the things that you've done, for saving us, for bringing us to yourself. Lord, we love you and we're so grateful uh, that we can know you, that we can walk with you, that we have you in our lives, and for all the blessings that you give us, Lord. And God, even though it's a little hot this morning, thank you that we can gather to worship you. Thank you that we, you've provided fans for us. Thank you for all the things that you provide and all the ways that you take care of us, far more than what we need and far more than what we deserve. So, Lord, we just lift up this morning. I pray for all those who are here sitting with us and for all those who are watching from home. Thank you that we can gather together and worship you, Lord. And we're not the only, only ones. We are just one small part of the body of Christ, one small part of your church that is gathering and worshiping all around the world this morning. May your name be lifted high. May your name be glorified. Strengthen your people and work in this world today. Lord, we love you so much. We surrender this time to you. Have your way in our hearts and our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Kids Corner. Uh, the title is The Little Things. Psalm 25, 14. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. How many of you enjoy the relationship you have with Jesus? If so, do you listen to Jesus when he urges you to do something for someone else? There is a reason Jesus wants you to respond. It could be that someone just needs a hug, um, a card, a phone call, a text, or maybe a delivery of food to their house, or just wants to be loved. Through this pandemic, I believe that our Lord just wanted me to do some of these things. I hope and pray that you hear our Lord speak to you to do something for someone else. A few weeks ago, I found a poem entitled The Little Things by Francis Culp Wolf, which touched my life, and I hope it will touch yours. It goes like this. The Little Things. Sometimes we think the little things don't accomplish much in life. The things we do seem so futile. Everywhere we look, there is strife. Little things don't stand alone, but total more than we can say. They're never sold or put on loan, just freely given day by day. A flower we may take someone, or a card sent in the mail. A smile when someone's dejected means more than words can tell. A task done for the elderly. A sick child we give a toy. A handshake, you know, a handshake with a stranger can fill the heart with joy. No deed is ever too little when we do it from the heart. And when God is in the center, it becomes a work of art. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to build our friendship with you so that we can serve others in the simple things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ruth Marie. So let's continue our worship. Again, stand if you want to. Stay seated if you like. We're going to sing hymn number 275, How Firm a Foundation.
going to be reading our scripture this morning from Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 36. And it begins this way, while they were still talking about this, so let me just take a minute and explain what the this is. This is found in a passage after Jesus had raised from the dead, and there's this encounter um, where, where these two guys are walking on this road, and Jesus kind of appears to them, and he's walking with them, but they don't know that it's Jesus. And so he, you know, he's asking them why they're so sad, and they're like, have you not heard what's happened? You know, where are you from that you don't know what's happened here? We thought, we thought this guy Jesus was, was going to be our Messiah, but then they crucified him, and he's dead. And, and so Jesus is just kind of listening to them, and then he reveals himself to them that he is actually Jesus, and he has raised from the dead. And so they were so excited, these guys, and they ran all the way to Jerusalem to find the other 11 disciples and to let them know that Jesus had raised from the dead. So they're talking about this that's what the this is in this moment while they were still talking about this Jesus himself stood among them and said to them peace be with you they were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost he said to them why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds look at my hands and my feet it is I myself touch me and see a ghost does not flesh and a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have When he had said this he showed them his hands and feet and while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement he asked them do you have anything here to eat They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence He said to them this is what I told you while I was still with you Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now think about that for a second. Everything before Jesus was pointing to Jesus. Sometimes we, we get in the habit, I think, as, as Christians today, that we think, we kind of forget about the Old Testament and things, think that things started with Jesus. But Jesus is saying here, all these things are written about me, and all these things must be fulfilled. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Essentially, that's why I'm here with you now. I've risen from the dead. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you that we can come into your presence, that we can talk to you, that you are listening, that you know our needs before we even ask. Thank you that you are worthy of praise. These songs that we're singing, uh, these things that we say about you, these ways that we describe you, there is no one else fitting but you. So, Lord, we do, again, just give you all praise. Lord, I pray for all those who are listening this morning. You know their hearts, you know their needs, you know their desires, you know the things that are weighing on them. God, would you fill each one with peace? Will you fill us with joy in your presence this morning? Thank you for this church family, for the body of Christ for how you use us to strengthen each other and be strengthened by each other. May that happen today, too. Father, thank you for bringing Pastor Scott to us. I pray as he comes and speaks now that you will empower him. Lord, may it not just come with, with words, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Strengthen him and speak through him, speak to him and speak through him to us. Open up your word. Give us understanding. Open our minds so that we can understand your words, your truths, and give us boldness and power and um, all that we need to be able to live these things out, what you're saying to us, what you're doing in us. May we not just hear your word and walk away and forget, 
but may we embrace these words and live them in our lives. Thank you that you're here with us. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. Do you ever have one of those moments, or one of those mornings, rather, where you just can't seem to quite get up and get going? Anybody? Is that just me? Okay. There's a few of you out there. Well, I think our church building's having one of those mornings today, um, and that's okay. Uh, it reminds me a little bit about being uh, at a camp meeting. Anyone? Ever remember going to a camp meeting service and you, you sit in the tabernacle and you sweat your, you, you just sweat it all out. And, uh, but we come to hear the word of God, we come to worship, we come to encourage one another. And so I'm grateful to see you all here in the service this morning. When I was in seventh grade, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, in the course of her treatment, she had a couple of surgeries, she underwent radiation, and ultimately she was declared cancer-free, and she has been ever since. Um, but when we got that diagnosis as a family, I got angry. I got angry. I was so angry with God that he would allow my mom to face something like that. We were a good Christian family. We were always in church. My parents served in ministries. They served on committees within the church. And it didn't seem fair to me. It didn't seem right. And I couldn't understand how a God, a good God, who said he loved us, would let something like that happen to a family like mine. Why do good things happen to bad people? Would I serve a God who allowed things like this to happen? I had to wrestle through all of that. Anyone ever been in a place like that in their lives? I think from time to time, we all have questions. Questions about life, questions about God, questions about our faith. These questions can make us curious and send us looking for answers, grappling with realities, digging for truth. Those same questions can also, at times, raise more questions, or maybe even introduce some doubts or resentment when we don't get the answers that we're looking for. But faith and questions, or even faith and doubts, don't have to be mutually exclusive. And having questions or doubts doesn't mean you don't have faith or that your faith is somehow deficient. I know I've got a long list of questions that I can't wait to ask God someday. In the scripture passage that Sean read for us today, we read about the last time that Luke records Jesus eating with anybody. Although maybe a bit of a stretch to call this one a meal. It was maybe more of a little snack. Um, but anyway, this is the first time that the disciples saw Jesus after his resurrection. And I can't imagine the thoughts and emotions that must have been swirling inside them that evening. What a roller coaster it had been the last few days. They had celebrated the Passover meal with Jesus just on Thursday. And Jesus instilled that familiar meal with all that new meaning that we talked about a few weeks ago. But then Jesus had been arrested and sentenced to death. And he had been crucified on Friday and then hastily buried in a borrowed tomb before the Sabbath began. That Saturday must have lasted forever as the disciples sat in their grief and their confusion. I mean, this wasn't the way it was supposed to happen. This wasn't the way it was supposed to go. The Messiah was supposed to be the victor, not the victim. He wasn't supposed to die, at least in their minds. But then on Sunday morning, early in the morning, the women had gone to properly prepare Jesus' body for burial. But he wasn't there. Instead, two angels told them that Jesus had ridden, 
risen. And the disciples didn't believe the women at first. But then even Peter went and looked for himself, and he saw the empty tomb. All that had just happened the very morning of the day that we were reading about. The first day of the week. And now, where the apostles and disciples had gathered, Jesus shows up. It's no wonder that their minds were blown. It makes my mind spin just to think about it. And I have the luxury of having read about it many times over and over. The disciples were gathered, and they were talking about this report that Jesus had appeared to the two disciples, like Sean was telling us. They were on their way home to Emmaus, and and when Jesus revealed himself to them, they ran all the way back to Jerusalem to let the disciples know about it. But we're not going to spend a lot of time on that service, on that story, this service. Come back in a few weeks and we'll talk about that one. Um, But they were talking about this story of Jesus appearing after his resurrection. And Jesus appears to them. No wonder they thought he was a ghost. Normal people can't do that. They don't do that. But then again, Jesus wasn't a normal person, was he? I can just imagine Jesus at that point being kind of playfully nonchalant. Hey guys, what's going on? Why are you so troubled? Can't you see that it's me? What's with all the doubt? It, uh, listen, if you don't believe your eyes, use your fingers. Touch, touch these holes. But Luke says they still didn't believe. And to me, That seems like a perfectly normal response to an absolutely abnormal situation. And I think Jesus got that. I think he understood. He gets that what has happened here is a little outside the norm. So he doesn't scold them. He doesn't berate them or mock them for their doubts and their unbelief. He's gracious with them. And he wants to help them get to a point where they do believe. So he tries another tack. He does one of the most normal things you can do. He asks for a piece of fish, and he eats it. And I wonder, how many times over the past three years had Jesus eaten some fish with those disciples? And he eats with them. And he reveals again his humanity to them. This wasn't some kind of disembodied Jesus spirit. This was the same Jesus that had shared countless meals with them. The same Jesus who bore in his body those marks of crucifixion. The same Jesus who had defeated death and was alive and would never die again. And Jesus says to him, this is what I was telling you. This is what I was trying to get you to understand. This is it. And then in verse 45, I think this is key, so I don't want you to miss it. Verse 45, then Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Jesus' death and resurrection became the lens through which all the law and the prophets and the writings, all the Hebrew scriptures became clear and focused. This event reframed everything and set the apostles and disciples on a new trajectory, which wasn't really a new trajectory at all. Jesus became the key to reinterpreting all that God had been doing down throughout history and which gave them that new purpose and mission to move into the future. See, in the midst of their questions, in the midst of their doubts, in the midst of their confusion and their fears and their lack of understanding, Jesus said, I'm the key to making this all make sense. Or as he said in John 14, I am the way and the truth 
and the life. Jesus didn't expect them to get all their questions sorted out before they believed. But he also knew they'd never get their questions answered apart from him. See, what we believe matters. And what we believe about Jesus matters supremely. It shapes who we are and what we do. And it can't just be based on how we feel about Jesus or, or how the things Jesus said makes us feel. You see, there's a trend in our culture that we need to talk about because it's found its way into the church. Now, I'm, I'm talking about the big C church around the world, not just the little C church here in, in Collingswood. But it's a trend that elevates doubt to the level of a virtue. And it makes certainty almost a sin. It rejects the idea that there is absolute objective truth. Which means that all truth is subjective and relative. That's not the kind of doubt that I'm talking about here today when I say that there's room in our faith for doubt and questions. We can know the truth. Because the truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. The fact that there is a truth that we can know doesn't mean that we should get arrogant or, or think that we know it all or, or that we've got it all figured out, and people need to get it right before they can come to Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that there is an objective truth that is independent of how you or I feel. And that truth has been revealed to us in the person of Jesus and in the word of God. And God has given us his Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. My mom was diagnosed with cancer the summer before my seventh grade year. And that next summer... I found myself sitting in an evening service at Delanco Camp Meeting. Maybe another reason today feels a little familiar as we sit in the heat. But that night, the evangelist was preaching about surrender and about how too often we offer God 10% and think that that's enough. And think that that that's what he's asking for. When what he's really asking for is all of us. At the end of the sermon, as, as the evangelist was moving into a time of response and prayer at the altar, he started singing the old hymn, I Surrender All. Anybody know that one out there today? I'm sure many of you do. So he started singing, I surrender all. But instead of singing the actual words, he was singing, I surrender ten. I surrender ten. Ten percent, my blessed Savior. I surrender ten. And it was in that moment, all the pieces clicked together into place for me. And I knew in that moment that God was inviting me to follow him. No matter what came, no matter good or bad, whether I understood or not, whether I had my questions answered or not. Placing my trust in Jesus didn't mean that all of my questions were answered. And it didn't mean that all my doubts or fears disappeared. Placing the full weight of my trust on Jesus meant that I was choosing my faith. What I knew to be true over my questions and ahead of my doubts. And when the two didn't line up, I was choosing to trust the goodness of God while I continued to look for more answers, and while I sought more understanding, and even when I still felt afraid. Because there's room in our faith 
for honest questions and honest doubt. And we don't need to shy away from those things when they come up. Our God's big enough to handle our questions and our doubts and our fears. But we need to come to the point where we're willing to give it all to him and tell him that we're choosing faith even as we seek understanding. Jesus revealed himself to the disciples that day in the midst of their pain and in the midst of their confusion and in the midst of their doubt. And he didn't condemn them for it. He entered into it with them. Jesus showed them that he was the truth that would open up their understanding. And Jesus invited them to place the full weight of their trust on him, even while their faith was seeking understanding. Friends, Jesus wants to come alongside us today in the midst of whatever pain or confusion or doubt you're going through. He wants to enter into it with you, and he wants to show you the truth, and he's inviting you to place your full trust in him, even if you don't have it all figured out. Would you pray with me? God, we're so grateful that in the midst of all the things we experience in life, the questions and doubts and fears that come, you come alongside us. You enter into it with us. And you reveal yourself to us as, as the key that can help us understand even if we don't get all of our questions answered. Thank you for inviting us to walk with you and trust you. Help us to place our faith in you and you alone, knowing that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that we can come to God because of you. Amen. We're going to sing a song as we move towards the, the close of our service called This I Believe. And in this song, we're going to sing the core beliefs of our Christian faith. And as we sing, I want to invite you to place your trust in Jesus, whether that's for the first time or for the hundredth time. And then after singing, we're going to uh, recite together the Apostles' Creed as a declaration and an affirmation of what we believe and in whom we believe. So let's sing together. Stand or sit as you feel comfortable. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, 
I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Sing it with me. I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe you rose again. I believe you rose again. Believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Sing it again. I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe you rose again I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord I believe in life eternal I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church i believe in the resurrection when jesus comes again for i believe in the name of jesus i believe in god our father i believe in christ the son i believe in the holy spirit our god is three in one i believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for i believe in the name of jesus for i believe in the name of jesus one more time for i believe in the name of jesus brothers and sisters i want to invite you to pull out your hymnal just in case the screen doesn't keep up with us but if you open that front cover the apostles creed is printed right there if you need it Let's affirm our faith together in Jesus. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.